All right. Glory. Hallelujah. How about that? Can you say amen? Can you say hallelujah? All right. That's good. That's good, folks. Well, welcome. So glad everybody is here and with us today. We want to also thank our online audience. Thank you all for being with us and being, participating as best you can. Use some chat. Use some comments. Let us know you're here. We are so glad. So glad that you guys are here. In fact, I know you've been, you want to feel and, and be part of the church. I know it's hard this way. I know some of that you are online have been in and out and here and, and serving and those type of things. Uh, we forgot to do a little bit of a shout out last week because the Saturday before we gave out a thousand gift bags to our community. So I want to... Uh, I want, to, I want to thank our congregation for being part of that, and uh, what a blessing, just what a blessing. Well, over the past several weeks, we have been in Advent, so we have been claiming things like hope, right? We've been claiming love, we've been play, claiming God's joy last week. Did you have some joy last week? Raise your hand. Have some joy? Yeah, I had some joy, definitely. And so today, we are going to be claiming peace. Yeah, peace. I, I remember as a child, and, and believe it or not, I do remember some things, and, you know, as a kid, peace wasn't a big thing. It was all about the uh, cornucopious of unbridled avarice of opening your presents on Christmas morning, but I do, as a child, do remember a bit of peace, even as a kid. I would lay in front of our fireplace. We had a real fire, real fireplace, real wood, all that good stuff. And I just remember kind of laying on the hearth as a kid and, and watching the, and listening to the logs burn and crackle and, and go down into an ember where it was just this beautiful orange and red glow and you could see the, the heat just radiating off of the logs and embers. It, it is probably one of my most peaceful memories of childhood. Well, uh, these days, uh, I don't have a real fireplace. In fact, I have that. And I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. It, 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 it looks kind of real, but it's, it's plastic and it's, it's electric. <laughs> I don't have to clean it. Uh, but it's really, I can't glean that same kind of peaceful moment uh, with that thing. But what I do uh, pretty much every morning at Christmas time is I get my coffee. <sighs> Love the coffee. And I look at this. This is the, the tree that I see every morning. We, there it is. There it is. It's up on the screen. And I sit before that tree, and, and it's, well, it's busy with ornaments and all kinds of different things on it. I just sit there and get the Word of God out and read and pray and just let the season of peace get into me. Well, that's my hope for you today, that you can experience that kind of peace. Now, when we define peace, normally it's just, it's simply just a, a freedom from disturbance, freedom uh, from uh, chaos, uh, synonyms for peace or tranquility and calmness. It is uh, a freedom from war and turmoil. But when we understand peace from the Bible, a more biblical understanding of peace, it is a much richer, richer understanding. It, it, it really is built on the Hebrew word shalom, beautiful word. And in that wonderful, wonderful Hebrew word, there is this understanding of wholeness and completeness. And, and even a sense that there's someone else with you in that word, there is the idea of fulfillment, even, even blessing and success and harmony, security, well-being, all those are wrapped up into this one little Hebrew word in the Bible, shalom. It, it is used by Jewish people even today as, as a greeting, a salutation, uh, and, and, and it means a blessing of God on that person to have peace. It, I believe even in the Catholic Church, they they do this thing called the, the sign of peace. You know, peace be with you and also with you. And you shook hands, I think, is what you did. They kite. I don't know what they're doing now with COVID there. They're probably, you know, high-fiving maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but you, you understand this idea of peace with, within the church, within the body of Christ is so, 
so important. And, and, and like joy, okay, peace is eternal. It is immune from, from external circumstances. And, and just like Kathy said just a minute ago, peace is not found in the absence of problems, but rather in the presence of God in your problems. Amen? Let me say that one more time. Don't miss this, because peace is not found in the absence of problems. Rather, it is in the presence of God in the midst of your problems. Amen? It is a wonderful thing. Well, COVID has thrown all kinds of non-peace into our world, right? The unrest, the change, the commotion, the people that never, ever wanted to be homeschoolers are kind of homeschooling right now. Uh, people have lost jobs. People have lost income. People have been isolated from the ones they love. People, they have to go into the hospital. You can't be with those people. And, and just, you know, peace there, that's so hard. Well, lack of peace in our world and in our country uh, seems to be growing really exponentially. Uh, one of the worst things out there that robs us of peace. And, and I don't want you to fall into this trap, and if you've fallen into this trap, let me help you get out of this trap. It, it's growing like crazy, and it is, I heard another pastor preach this, so this isn't my idea or my words here, but it, I, I heard this and I was like, man, he is just spot on. And, and he basically said that we live in an age of perpetual offense. We are now living in an age of perpetual offense. People are so quick to say, uh, 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 I'm, you're judging me. Uh, they're so quick to get angry at everything. Oh, you offended me. Oh, I, I don't agree with what you said, so I'm canceling you. I mean, it wasn't like that a few years ago. But we are now living in an age of perpetual offense, and it doesn't matter if you meant it or not, or if you even go back and apologize. It is a disturbing change in our world, and we need to know something, and that is if you live, okay, in search of being offended, you are guaranteed to find it. <laughs> if you live in search of it, you will find it, I guarantee it. The problem is there is no win, and there is no peace if you are living to be offended. I don't hear anybody say, oh, my life is so much better because I get angry at everybody. We don't, that doesn't help. We need to realize that people have different views. We need to realize that in this day, in this age, in this world right now, people are hurting, people are suffering. These are unprecedented times. And as followers of Jesus, folks, and this is where your notes begin if you take notes today. As followers of Jesus, you need to know something. Being offended is inevitable. You will be offended. Living offended is a choice. Living offended is a choice. As followers of Jesus, Jesus gives us choices when it comes to being offended. We have to open up our hearts sometimes and and apply grace to someone or mercy to someone. We need to reply, apply peace in a situation maybe. Maybe it's forgiveness or maybe it's even this person di disagrees with what I think and say and you know what, I'm going to have to be okay with that. Now I'm not saying there aren't things in our world that we have to not take offense to. We do. I mean, things will be offensive. But something else, something else besides that has come into play in the world around us, also rather negative and rather new and rather alarming. And it is what I refer to as nationalism and Christianity. They're getting confused by many. You see, peace is not found in a president Okay, it's found exclusively in Jesus Christ. Jesus' followers are not to be known 
by their party affiliation. They're supposed to be known by their love. The peace of God comes not because you align with one group of people or another. The peace comes because you have a relationship with Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. And we as Christians need to be wise in these days. I love the way the message translates James 3.17. He said, real wisdom, godly wisdom, or God wisdom, is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessing. Not hot one day and cold the next. Not too fake. It is our being grounded in Christ that allows us to experience God's peace and live God's peace in front of the world. And this, in these days, is very, very important for us. And let's be real. Everyone needs peace, right? Uh, we, we joke about the beauty queen who gets the question in the interview section and says, oh, well, what, what are you going to be working for? I'm going to be working for world peace, right? Yeah, world peace. And the truth is, every one of us wants peace in our life. We all desire that. The problem is sometimes we seek for peace in the wrong places and in the wrong ways. We seek for it in our, in our career. We seek for it because of the money we, we want or desire or get. We seek for it in, in personal relationships. But true peace, true peace really is only found in God, in Christ. If you're married, you want peace, right? I've, I've counseled with enough married couples. I am married. I understand this very clearly. I don't want arguments. I don't want turmoil. I want peace in this relationship. And the thing about that, and especially in a, in a marriage relationship, it takes work. It, it takes effort. It, that You have to, to, to work towards that peace. But true peace, again, is found in God. And truth be told, when it comes to peace, whether you have money problems, if you got money problems, you can still have peace. You, you have a child that's gone the wrong way, got into pornography or drugs or something else, you know what? You still can have peace if God's in the midst of it. When you're talking about God's peace, Understand that it is God in the midst of your problems that gives you that peace. Let me just pray for a minute. Father, if there's anyone here, anyone listening today, hearing this, and they're in the midst of a deep problem, a deep hurt, I pray that they would see Jesus as the author and source of their peace and get it. Amen. He is. Jesus is the author and true source of our peace. And as I've studied the scriptures here, and each year I do this, and I just get more blown away and more blown away about how much uh, peace has to do, especially with Jesus. Jesus came into this world to be our teacher and to be our shepherd and to be our servant and to be our savior. We learned last week that Jesus came to give us joy, right? Jesus came that we might have peace. It is all throughout the scriptures. Let me take you to a couple places here. These aren't on the screen, but uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, he is called what? The Prince of Peace, right? And to his uh, government, essentially, there is no end to his peace, it says. Amen, I can't wait for that. <laughs> in Luke, chapter 2, when, when he, the angels come and announce the birth of Jesus, it says, glory to God in the highest, they announce, and peace, or on earth peace among men, with whom I'm well pleased. Peace among men at the announcement of Jesus' birth. 
And we read the scripture today about Simeon, the, the old priest who had been promised that he would see the Messiah before his death. When Jesus is brought up to him, his response was, Now your servant can depart in peace because of Jesus. John the Baptist, in his announcement of Jesus' ministry, that, you know, don't even worry about me. I can't even tie the shoes of the guy that's coming. This guy. He says this, and this is on the screen. It says, he says, they will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadows of death to what guide our feet, our feet in the way of peace. Jesus came to guide us in the way of peace. What a beautiful thing. What a wonderful promise. His mission, his purpose is, we see, well documented when it comes to this idea that we should have peace. We listen to Jesus' comments in, in the Gospels, and so many times after healing somebody or talking with somebody, he says, go in peace. Go in peace. The Apostle Paul, almost in every one of his letters, starts them, or he ends them, with the phrase, grace and peace with you, or grace and peace to you. Amazing how prevalent The idea of peace is in the scriptures. In Jesus' own words, recorded in the book of John, Jesus gives his disciples this idea of peace. When he's getting ready to leave, basically he tells them, he promises them, uh, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives it. No, no, not as the world gives it. It's a different peace. Let not your hearts be troubled. Okay, and neither be afraid. You see, the peace that Jesus gives to us is peace that, well, when we're troubled, <laughs> it can overcome those troubles. When we're fearful, Jesus' peace can calm all our fears. You see, that is an incredible, wonderful promise. You see peace in Jesus. He extinguishes troubles and puts out our fears. Now I know, I know as followers of Jesus, we believe this. <laughs> we certainly hope for this. We want this peace deep in our hearts. But truth be told, <laughs> sometimes peace is just darn hard to find, isn't it? You can kind of say amen, but you, yeah, you, you, we all know this. It, it's just, just really hard to find at times. I, I, I'm going to confess a little bit here, um, and it has to do with uh, Christmas Eve. We've got two services set up, one at 3 o'clock and one at 5 o'clock. And, and we've kind of said if we don't get the attendance people to sign up, uh, we're just going to run the 5 o'clock service. And it's crazy how much this has stressed me out, and I've really, really, really tried to find some peace because do we want to take people away from their homes uh, for longer than we have to on a Christmas Eve and run two services? Or do we want to stay open in faith that people come in that maybe didn't sign up or just looking for an opportunity to have a Christmas Eve service? So I'm conflicted. (laughs) But, but I can tell you this, in the midst of my conflict, I'm trying to write this sermon. (laughs) I'm like, John, you fool, just ask God for some peace. So I'm all peaced out about this thing. It's all on Jesus now. I really don't care what happens. <laughs> Amen? Well, another great reason we have peace, a wonderful reason we have peace is because Jesus has another name, right? We sang about it, I think, today. Emmanuel, which you all know means God with us. God with us. When we have God with us, we can have peace. Because he says also in John's gospel, in chapter 16, uh, I have said these things th- that you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, folks, but <laughs> don't worry. I've overcome the world, Jesus said. And because I've done that, you have peace, because I am with you. 
I, I'm going to pause for a minute, and so those who are, are going to get ready, uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper right here in the, in the middle of this message today. Because I thought about it as I was praying and preparing this message, that what, what a great reminder it is to take the Lord's Supper when it comes to God's peace, when it comes to his peace. And so today, uh, gentlemen will be passing out the elements. Uh, you have the option of the newer element we have with both contained or the older style element <laughs> today. Uh, as they pass them out, take them, hold on to them, and then we will, we will take them together. But as they pass out and as you pray for just a moment, I, I, want you to, I want you to remember what we're celebrating. We take the bread as a reminder of Christ's body, okay? That was broken for us on the cross. We take the, the juice, the wine, and if you're at home, go ahead and, and get your elements together. But we take the, the juice, and it is a reminder of the blood that was shed by Jesus. So it covers our sins, so that we then can be in heaven with a perfect, sinless God, and we have relationship with him, and that you and I have this incredible, incredible peace because we can go to the God of the universe and say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Chuck So just take a moment. Remember that God is in us as we take these elements. That God is with us as we take these elements. bread. It is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ, shed for the remission of our sin. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful and beautiful reminder as we take these elements into our body that we know and are assured through our relationship with you, through our faith, that you indwell us through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you are with us in every problem and every bit of turmoil, and that you have overcome the world, and that through you, we, in the midst of everything that we have experienced in 2020, in years past, in years to come, we have peace with you, peace with God. Amen. Well, the scriptures give us other ways for us to have peace with God, to experience that peace. I'm going to lay the foundation for this experience of peace with an Old Testament verse, and then I'm going to help us apply it with a New Testament verse. Together, I believe this provides the way of personal peace the way of personal peace. It starts out this way, okay? <laughs> peace starts in your minds. It starts about 
what you think about, what you believe. And it is a battle, right? Because in our minds, well, they tend to wander, <laughs> right? They, they tend to go to places like, oh, yeah, I, that person's so spiritual, they can have some peace, but I can't. I don't have that. I don't have that. I'm not good enough, or I'm not close enough to God, or we, we somehow rationalize our peace away sometimes. But let me give you a, a really, really cool foundational verse for you. It actually comes out of Isaiah also. It comes in, in chapter 26. He, he's just actually kind of prophesized what I believe to be uh, the heavenly kingdom that is to come. And then he starts in verse 3, and he says, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. He trusts God. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Wow. He says here that if we keep our minds stayed on him, we can have perfect peace. <coughs> in, in the original language, that is a really emphatic statement. That is like saying you're going to have super duper peace. <laughs> it, it is peace on top of peace that you're going to get if you keep your minds stayed on him. Uh, this is the idea where, and, and this word really means to, to lean on. I can lean on this table for a little bit, but if I put all my weight on it, I'm going over and it's going to get ugly because there's fire and everything. And we don't want to do that. But when it comes to God, we can completely lean on, stay on him, give him everything that is in your arsenal of troubles and trials and tribulations, throw them at him, he can handle it. The thing is, where is our mind? Where are we keeping it? Where's our time spent when we have discretionary time? You know, I understand when you're at work and you're doing this and you're doing that, you can't be thinking about God all the time. But what about that discretionary time? Is it true that we might have to put our cell phones down? I guess unless you're on the Bible app. Okay. But the TikToks and the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and maybe they, maybe they need to be put to the side for just a little bit so we can stay our mind on Christ. If your indiscretionary time is focused in on CNN and Fox, you're not going to have a lot of peace, just saying. Your mind gets fixed on fears. Your mind can get fixed on political challenges. Your mind's, and again, I'm not saying that we put our head in the sand, Christian. We shouldn't, by all means. But what I am saying is let God be on top of all those things. So you can stay, lean on, lean into God in the midst of all those things. So how do we more practically keep our minds stayed on peace and God and all those wonderful things? Well, because the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church, and he wrote a wonderful statement in verse 8 of chapter 4. He tells the brothers there to, well, whatever is true, okay, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure and whatever is lovely, whatever, anything that's commendable out there, anything that's excellent, anything that's worthy of praise, he says, think about those things. Keep your mind stayed on those things. Take your mind to the things of God. When you keep your mind stayed on God, when you go there in the midst of the problems, well, then he writes in verse 9, a verse that many of us are familiar with. He says, what you learned and received and heard and seen in me, because this is the way he lives, this is the way Paul lives, he says, practice these things. And the God, <laughs> and the God of peace, will be with you. Amen? Amen. Do these things. Focus on these things. 
Make sure these things are, are, are things that you're, you're going through your mind more than once a day, and God's peace will be with you. Peace that, you know what, when you're hurting, when you're struggling, you sense God's comfort peace with you. When you're feeling weak, God gives you a peace that gives you strength. When you're feeling kind of lost and nowhere, nowhere to go next, he gives you a peace that is guidance. And bi the Bible tells us that God's peace and God's love, nothing <laughs> can put it away. Nothing can overrule it. Not, not powers and spiritual forces and, and anything else can keep us from God's love. He tells us that you and I, <laughs> we're more than conquerors when it comes to the troubles and the trials of this world. Can I hear an amen? All that is part of our peace that God gives to us. And this peace is perfect. God's peace. So let me give you a plan for peace, folks. Here's what I know you can do. I've done it. It gives me peace. I want you to do it. Some of you are already doing this already, and I know you're experiencing God's peace. But number one, very simple. This isn't real hard. Uh, read God's Word. <laughs> Just make sure reading God's Word is part of your daily life in some way, shape, or fashion, even if it's just a, a few minutes in the morning. It is a lamp under your feet. It is a light under your path. It is to be read. The second one is to write, to journal. Now, I know not many people do this. This is something I do off and on. I've got myself back on that track. And if I was to go into the Bible and say, hey, there, I remember Jesus telling me, you've got to make sure you write down your prayers. He never said that. I get that. But... <laughs> I take it from the example of David, and I take it from the example of Paul. The majority of the Psalms that we read are David's thoughts and prayers that he's been given to us. Paul wrote one-third of the New Testament because he wrote down his experiences with God for our blessing. And so I can tell you, even in my in my last several weeks, I, I've, I've got a journal that goes back about 10 years. And, and, and I take time sometimes to go back and read a journal entry from the past. <laughs> and I can tell you, folks, it's just encouraging. It's just encouraging to see how God was taking me through this particular thick situation, this trouble, and, and, and where I am now, and, and just being able to just praise God again. So let me encourage you. If you don't journal, man, I, I encourage you, even if it's just a couple sentences a day, I encourage you to, to write, to write. Next one is to pray, right? We're to pray without ceasing. Yep, well, that's pretty thing. We're just talking to God, and it should be the first thing we think of when troubles and trials come that let me pray. And, and you've heard me talk about my wife and her parking spots, and it is truly amazing. But pray. Pray about all things, especially when troubles come. And the last one is, I want you to praise God. Praise God. And that may be listening to some music and, and just getting on YouTube and thumbing through some, some songs. But make sure you take time to praise God. I, psalm 150 goes nuts. It's the, it's, the end, it's the last of the psalms. It's not David's psalm, but it, it's a psalm that says, you know, praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him up in the heavens. Praise him by the powerful acts that he does. Praise him for his greatness. It just goes on. Get your tambourine out. Get your guitar out, whatever. He goes, just praise him. Just praise him. It doesn't say guitar, I know. The new translation. But the idea is to praise him. In Psalm 34, it starts out, let us praise, or let our praise be continually from our mouth. And that is where David. My hope for you, as we get ready in a few days, in a few more days, we'll be able to celebrate the birth of Christ, remembering his first advent and anticipating his second advent. 
And my prayer for you is if you don't have these themes of Advent, you're not feeling the hope, you're not feeling the, the love, you're not feeling the joy, and you're not feeling the peace right now. My hope for you is that you do, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it is there, it is available for you. Just continue to seek it. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, if this all just kind of sounds nice and I'd like that, I'd encourage you right now to respond. To respond to God's gift. We are got to celebrate Christmas, and it is a gift that we celebrate. Gift from God from heaven to us. And it takes faith. It takes faith. It takes believing. And that you might ask him, even now, to be your Savior. Whether you're here, whether you're online, I pray you do that if you've never done that before. And if you do that, we want to help you. We want to, we want to walk with you in that journey, whether that's through <laughs> the Internet or that's through uh, you being here and being part of our congregation. So respond to us through our communication card. Let us know in some way, shape, or fashion how we can help you. Walk with Christ.